Hi everyone, my name is Rich Walter. I'm the curator for USA, Canada and Europe here at the Musical Instrument Museum. And I'm here in our conservation lab with a small number of mandolins from our collection. And just wanted to share some information with you if you're checking in with Mim from home. instruments that are currently in storage. They've either been on display in the past or they're about to be on display in new exhibits. As many of you know, our exhibits are always changing here and so we're really lucky to have a deep collection. We can keep on reimagining the stories we tell. The one I wanted to focus on today has to do with the popularity of the mandolin in the United States in the late 1800s and early 1900s. The mandolin at least this version of it, this would be called, let's say a Neapolitan style mandolin from Naples, Italy. It has this bowl back construction, uh, flat top here. This is a kind of a classic Italian style of mandolin, but this was actually made in Chicago. And this is the type of instrument that could have been available pretty affordably through mail order catalogs and would have been produced and, and purchased by the thousands when there was a, a real interest in mandolin orchestras here in the States. There were so many immigrants coming in in the late 1800s and a real powerful sense of community was developed as they created mandolin orchestras in their new hometown. So it's a really important uh, musical process embracing these mandolins and creating a sense of community with these ensembles and, and having access to mandolins but what happened, this is an American version of an Italian design. We also know that people got really creative and as they were adapting the ways they knew how to build instruments, they were trying to, to be part of that mandolin popularity. This one is a really fascinating one. This was made in 1896 by a man named Eugene Whitman in Brooklyn, New York. It certainly would appear that he was a violin maker. You look at the, you know, it's basically a violin body in every aspect, the types of woods, the types of construction, but he put a mandolin neck. So a mandolin has eight strings organized in four pairs. And so he had to figure out how to basically put a mandolin neck on a violin. He even went as far as figuring out how to retain a little bit of that violin scroll, but in a pretty inventive way on this instrument to add these eight tuners with these two scrolls on the top. So a really unusual instrument, really a beautiful instrument, uh, adapting the violin style of construction to the mandolin craze in the States. This was an alternative version of that. Again, late 1800s, early 1900s. This is a how Orm instrument uh, made in Boston. And so this has those same eight strings but you might notice it's basically a, a very small guitar. So it has this guitar shape, flat back, but really high quality instrument made to accommodate a, a mandolin neck. And it also really unusually, it might be hard to see, but it has this longitudinal arch down the top. This was pressed into place to give some extra strength to this thin top and sort of adapting a middle ground between carved violin tops and flat guitar tops. So people really trying to figure out what would be a, a new design for an eight stringed mandolin sized instrument. And actually these came in the whole spectrum of sizes to have a full ensemble. So a mandolin, a tenor mandola, an octave mandola, and then basically a mando cello. We're really pleased here at MIM, we have a complete set of four of these instruments, uh, thanks to Luthier Rick Turner for helping make that possible. But uh, it's really great to have a, a rare set of four of these How Orm instruments. Other solutions, once we got into the 1920s, the National Dobro Company were making resonator instruments to make these small instruments louder. And this is a resonator mandolin. So inside this metal plate, there's a, a basically a, a metal cone that acts like a mechanical loudspeaker, and these strings activate that cone to help amplify the acoustic sound. This happens to be kind of a fancy one with this 
scroll design across the body. And so just one more version of how people were really adapting designs that they applied to other types of instruments, guitars, uh, violins, all sorts of stringed instruments and, and making mandolin adaptations of them. I'm gonna move over here to this Lion and Healy design out of Chicago. This was actually built under the Washburn name, but it's a Chicago built American classical mandolin. You can actually see this scroll design familiar from the violin family, but it's a mandolin with a round sound hole, this arched spruce top carved out of solid wood, this carved arched back like a violin. There are actually a number of details that sort of remind me of violin construction on these classical style instruments as well. So this is a really fine American uh, classical mandolin and this particular one was owned by a woman named Mary Zelnick. She immigrated to the United States in the 1920s, I believe, uh, was part of the New York Mandolin Orchestra in the 1940s. She did some recording in the 1960s and later in her life she helped co-found the Florida Mandolin Orchestra. She, she was a lifelong advocate and ambassador for these mandolin orchestras, really a, a participant in the very story we've been talking about. And so it's really nice not only to have a high quality instrument in the collection, but to know that it was a personal instrument from a woman who, who really exemplified the story we like to tell with instruments like this. So it was owned and played and used by someone who was a real part of that history of mandolin orchestras in the United States. Again, from about 1930, and we're anxious to have that on display in the galleries before too long. And then the last stop is this fancy scroll model, F5 master model mandolin from the Gibson Company in Kalamazoo, Michigan. This particular one was made in the 1930s. This style was developed in the early 1920s. And ironically, this is sort of the, the ultimate uh, powerful, uh, great sounding mandolin that was developed in that heyday of the mandolin orchestra popularity right at a time when it was starting to lose steam and other instruments like banjos were starting to be more popular. So this came on the scene right when its function was, was not quite as useful and it was about 20 years later, among other things, that this was the style of mandolin that Bill Monroe chose to essentially create bluegrass music. He's the father of bluegrass music, so if you go to a bluegrass concert, you're very likely to see a mandolin that looks very much like this style, but this was uh, an original from the 30s. So again, a really high quality instrument with similar violin style constructions, not only the, the arched carved maple back, but you'll also notice these F holes, these F shaped sound holes like a violin. All of these were meant to increase the volume and projection and tone of the instrument. And this particular one is especially uh, important to us because it belonged to a man named Dave Apollon. He was a vaudeville artist and uh, a Russian virtuosic player who immigrated to the States and really carved out his own career and, and legacy as one of the most virtuosic mandolin players ever. This was one of his personal mandolins. We're thrilled to have it here. Um, and this is what he played, but it's also what Bill Monroe played for bluegrass music. And it's also what you can see Chris Thiele playing on, uh, on his variety radio program today. So a really versatile instrument that actually didn't find its place in a lot of uh, music making until couple decades after it was introduced as, as the ultimate mandolin of its era. So a really interesting story. It's just a little cross section of a few instruments that help uh, explain that early popularity of the mandolin in the United States. You can see the variety, the diversity of ideas and creativity as everyone was trying to rally around the popularity and the fun of, of playing these instruments in a whole variety of formats. Uh, so, hope you enjoyed that from home. 
and uh, we'll hope for you to visit MIM and see these on display before too long. Thanks.